Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And today I'm going to be looking at a case which is one of the most bizarre unsolved cases. Uh, and I've been requested repeatedly to analyze the case. It is the Setagaya family murders in Japan. Now, I just had a little uh, problem here with my uh, sound. Uh, so I want to check to see if you can actually hear me uh, before I continue on with the show. Can you hear me, folks out there? Okay, I see uh, Miranda's here, Down Under is here, and still and awake from Australia. Um, Elisa's here, Benny is here. Uh, let's see who else is. Leslie is here. Can anybody hear me? Because if not, I may have to restart the program. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Whew. Yeah, it, it was weird when I started. I did not hear the, usually I hear the intro and I didn't hear it. So I don't know if it was just that that messed up or <laughs> the whole show. So anyway. Oh, good. Good. All right. So we're all, we're good to go. All right. Now, Sky Ricky's here. Let's see. Alexandra's here. This is a popular case. Miranda's here. Uh, did I, Lila's here. Um, oof, uh, I, I know I'm missing people here because I'm running up and down. Annie's here. If I missed you, sorry. Um, if you would like to be here in the chat room and participate in uh, discussion here and also to be able to ask me questions and have them answered while I'm doing the show, please do join Patreon. Um, the link is below in the description. Uh, you can join that five bucks a month. You come to eight shows. Uh, we have a special patron chat area every week where we can talk and you can ask me questions there as well. And you also don't have to, if you're not paying for the, the special uh, YouTube where you don't have to listen to the advertising, you can come here during the live show and not have advertising. So that saves you money. Um, and also please do just uh, subscribe to the channel, like, and uh, hit the bell. So you get notifications. And I want to remind people again, the playlist, check the playlist uh, because there's different kinds. There's the playlist for the case file. So any case you're interested in might be there. I have the hangout playlist. Uh, I have the new Cleopatra playlist because uh, I'm doing uh, shows on the murder of Cleopatra. Um, so check the different playlists for things you're interested in. Okay. All right. Now to this case. All right. Let me, let me get back to this. All right. So really fascinating case in Japan. And I also want to mention to all of you folks who are Japanese who might be watching this show. <laughs> yes, my book, The Profiler is in Japanese. So yes, you can read my actual book if you don't speak English. So cool, huh? Um, I was set to go to Japan uh, when the book was published. Um, but uh, unfortunately, y'all got hit by a tsunami and kind of crushed the, print, uh, the publishing industry. So the whole trip was canceled. And I was so upset because I I didn't get to go to Japan. And I still haven't been to Japan. But my book is there or probably on Amazon, Japan, Amazon. <laughs> so you can check it out. Uh, the case is not in there because I didn't know about the case at the time I wrote the book. So all right. So let's see. What about this case? <sighs> It's also called, it, it's got a number of names. It's called the Setagaya family murders. I said Miyazawa murders, because that's the name of the family. Setagaya is the location they lived in outside of Tokyo. And it's also called the Goldilocks murders because the guy who went and killed this beautiful family uh, stayed in the house for at least six, seven hours after afterwards, like Goldilocks in the three bears, you know, just messing with everything that they owned. Um, so it's so unusual that it got that name as well. So, yeah. All right. So what about, oh, let me tell you where I got some of my information from. And by the way, I have a profile of the killer in this crime. Sometimes I tell you there's only so much I can, with the evidence that's available, I can only give certain ideas of how I would analyze this and where I would, would go with it. And sometimes, um, sometimes the, uh, it's some one of those so obvious things that, like, okay, the profile is not anything brilliant. <laughs> it could be this and that's that. Um, in this case, I think there's a lot of evidence, in my opinion, to allow me to speculate. And I will say speculate um, because I'm not inside the case. I'm not working with the police. I don't have every detail. But I have an idea of the what I would put at the top of my suspect list, the kind of person that I would be looking for at the top of my list. OK, so I do have that. I, I was wondering when I was doing this case, whether I would, whether I would come up with any conclusions. But I do have a focus on a particular type of suspect. So uh, but where did I get my information? All right. Uh, there actually is way more of it on the Internet than I thought there was going to be. But I basically got most of my stuff from two sources. Um, one 
is this podcast. It's called Faceless. Uh, I'll put the links below. Uh, I'm not sure if I can put the Faceless link because it's on many, many different podcasts, but I'll, I'll reference it below. Uh, Faceless. Um, this guy, um, uh, he, I should pull up his, I should pull up his information just so I don't not say who the guy is who did this. Hold on a second. Uh, let me find his name. Um, he worked very hard on this. He was very obsessed with this and he traveled even to the U S to, to, to study this particular case. Cause he just was trying to get all these answers. And uh, so he worked very hard at it. Um, his name is, sorry, I have a lot of things up here. Um, come on guy, where are you? <laughs> Seriously? <sighs> Oh, here it is. Okay. His name is Nick Obregon. Okay. Nick Obregon. Uh, he is the writer and host of this show. And I think it's six, seven parts. Um, so it took, takes a while to listen to. He's got a very good voice. He does one of those very dramatic podcasts. Um, I know some of the information conflicts with some other places of information. Sometimes I think he goes off on let's, let's explore something, which is maybe I could explore in 30 seconds, but he takes 30 minutes, you know, that kind of thing. Cause he's a podcaster and he's making it, um, you know, uh, fascinating and dramatic. Um, I think it does a good job in general. So, um, I think it's worth listening to, uh, the other site I got my information from, which I'll, I'm going to use during the show is called the rampage forensic mystery, the set of Gaia murders. Um, and I'm, I'm using this, not Wikipedia, because I, I like the way it's written um, and some of the information it has. And I got a lot of photos from that site. So I want to recognize them and that will be linked below. Um, again, I can't absolutely hundred percent say whether this particular piece of information is exactly right compared to this piece of information, because I'm not getting it from police reports, but in this particular case, there's no agenda like some other cases. So I don't have to say this person is trying to just fool us. And this person's telling the truth. No, these are people all interested in finding out who murdered this family. They don't have any, you know, they're not, they're not on one. And there's no other, any side. There's just the side of, can we catch the guy? That's it. Um, so there may be minute differences and maybe somebody quoted something incorrectly, but I don't think that's important in what I'm going to be doing in teaching. Again, this is an educational channel and showing you how I look at this case and why I think the certain ways I do. Okay. And I also want to say that uh, Nick in his, um, in his uh, this this uh, podcast does speak a number of times with uh, David Cantor. Um, we'll give him credit for speaking to somebody with some brains. Uh, David Cantor uh, is he, I'll read what who he is. He's uh, Britain's leading pioneer in psychological science of criminal profiling um, and big on serial killers. Um, and he this uh, Criminal Shadows book is excellent and um, it's. I think, uh, well, this is something I did research in years ago, and I've got lots of, lots of, I, I write, didn't read, but you can see all my note taking, because I like this guy's book, and I thought it was very informative, and he's one of the, one of the profilers in the world who I find, you know, we, again, how do I say this, we don't ever, everybody doesn't have to agree with everything, but I find him very, very good in his field, and has a lot to offer everybody, so I highly recommend this book, Criminal Shadows, and he is, he does speak about this crime, and I think his uh, profiling of this crime is very good. So I'm with him on it. <laughs> so, all right. So now let's get to the crime. All right. I'm already hot today. Whew. Oh, Lord. Why? Whew. All right. So the Setagaya, Setagaya murders. All right. Uh, this is the family, a family of four. On December 30th, 2000, so we're talking 20 years old, and the guy has never been caught. And the reason this case is so bizarre is that as i said in my description there's a crap load of crap load of evidence which includes crap because he also left some in the toilet so and they got they got information from that like what he what he had been eating before he came to the scene so it's it's amazing because so many times you have a case and you just don't have evidence to go on you know so you're like in the dark but in this case there's incredible amounts of evidence i mean the guy couldn't have left more evidence unless he wrote his name on the wall or took a picture of himself or went on, on well, back uh, 20 years ago, but you know, today maybe just go on a Snapchat or whatever Instagram and show the murder scene and with, with his face in it. Yeah. But so the only thing that's not there literally is a picture of his face or a video of him. 
uh, or his, you know, an ID that he dropped with his name on it. That's the only thing missing. Everything else is there. You know, they've got fingerprints, DNA, um, it's clothing. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And they have no idea who it is. And that's what's phenomenal about the case. Okay. So Tonya's here from uh, Portugal. Hi. <laughs> and Carrie's here. Oh, more people are coming in. Allison. Hi. Okay. So now, <clears throat> so on December 30th, 2000, the, uh, the Miyazawa family were murdered in their own home in the Setagaya ward of Tokyo, Japan. Uh, it's an unsolved case today uh, because of the criminal's abnormal behavior and the amount of evidence. All right. About the family, just so you know quickly who they are. Because one of the things you have to do, uh, you have to do victimology when you're looking at any kind of um, uh, crime, uh, especially murder, because the person's not alive anymore. So you want to find out who they are, what what they do, you know, what their work is, what their sport, their hobbies are. Are they in sports? Do, uh, you know, are, are there things going on in the family that are questionable? Like, are they involved in some kind of criminal activity, drug running? Um, you know, is there adultery going on? You want to look at everything about the family, the victims. It's called victimology because a good portion of time, the reason people get killed is because of something connected to them. And uh, in this case, there's really, really, my, this family is a very nice family. There's only one thing that I would say is like a, a, a recent event, which could lead to something. And I'll get to that. But anyway, this is Mikio, the father, who's 44 years old. He worked at home, a uh, London-based marketing firm, and he worked a lot. I mean, he was a, kind of a work-obsessed guy, uh, but supposedly a very good husband, a good father, and, and his financial records were like, since he was like a kid, he would write down every single thing he spent. So they actually knew about their financial situation. It was perfectly fine. Um, the wife, Yasuko, um, she's 41. She was a teacher who a, ran a cram school at the family home, and she spent a lot of time with the kids. So she was home with the kids, but she also taught out of the home to students who needed to, I guess, going to college and high school. And, of course, the police had that to check on. It was like, were, because did somebody know the inside of this home was the question, uh, so that they would be comfortable going into it. So it was this one of the students who had been in her home. And so that was heavily looked into. Uh, Nina, uh, she was eight years old, the little girl, she was in second grade, and Ray, uh, he was six years old, and he was in kindergarten, okay, he had a little bit of a speech problem, he had, and she worked, she hired a professional to work with him, so again, the police are going to check out all the connections to the family, in case there's one person with a screw loose, uh, somebody who gets pissed off at the family, and, or has some, something wrong with him, and, but he knows the house, uh, and the people, it could be a revenge killing, for example, um, so it's important to know. Uh, the other thing I would assume they have checked, or I didn't see any of this, is who had been in the house recently. Um, uh, supposedly the guy came in through the, the back of the house through a second story window into the bathroom. And I point this out to all of you out here, a safety technique, is that when you have somebody come into your house to do work, uh, so say a painter or somebody's coming in to work on your plumbing, uh, and they go into your bath, or they just say, can I borrow your bathroom? I know because they're working on your house. You say, sure. They go into the bathroom. My question is, how often when they when they leave, do you go and check the bathroom window to see if they if it's still locked or did somebody go in there and unlock the window, especially a first floor window, because that way they can come back at night and the window, they just lift the window up. And most people don't check those things. They don't check to see whether the person who was working in their house or came into their house did something sneaky <laughs> and uh, and, and set up an access to your home at another point in time. So that's something important uh, to, to check. And uh, I don't have any information on who was in their home, perhaps doing any kind of work prior to, to the murders. Somebody who could have gone into that bathroom on the second floor and opened, made it, made it easy to get into. Um, I can't seem to find info on that. So, yeah. So anyway, um, so they moved into the house in 1990. They lived next door. This is a duplex house. They're in this house, and next door is uh, uh, Yasuko's mother and her sister and brother-in-law. And so there's no, there's no, it's kind of like me. I live in this house here, and my daughter's next door. And we have, we don't have access between the homes. So to go into her house, I have to go outside and around. She has to do the same, come outside into my house, and the same here. So you have two separate families, just very close to each other and very useful to each other. But um, they, there's that wall between 
which may prevent these people from here really knowing what's going on over here. So, and that is important because four people were murdered here and they didn't know it. Her, uh, I'll read what happened in the morning. Uh, um, so you'll see that. But okay, so nearby, the family's house was located directly behind uh, Soshigaya Park, which also contained a skate park for, for uh, skateboarders. That's important because skateboarders become one of the top suspect categories, skateboarders. Uh, the park had been there for many years, very popular. Due to this, the city had planned to expand it. The plan was going to cost 200 families who originally lived there in 1990. They were, they were paying these people to move out. And there were only four, four families left. And, and, this, uh, uh, this, and the uh, Miyazawas were one of those who hadn't moved out. And the question is, did they not, they, did, were they waiting for more money? Had they not gotten around to it? What was the reason? And this becomes another theory that the company that wanted them out hired a hitman to kill the family so they get the house which seems to me quite stupid. So, because in, in the long run, the house is still there. Oddly enough, 20 years later, it's still there under guard. The park is around it. <laughs> the house is still there and they never built the rest of the stuff. So, very bizarre. Anyway, the, the skate park had been causing problems for the family due to loud noise. Uh, Mikio, and this is one thing that happened prior, had confronted a group of loud teenagers for making too much noise. So, they, then, so but they were planning to move because they were kind of fed up with all of it. But they just didn't get out in time. All right. Uh, uh, Saturday, December 30th. And we're talking about winter here. This is important, too, because winter has the advantage for people in, that they can cover up more, wear gloves on their hands. They can wear a mask on their face before COVID, you know, and nobody was suspicious because it's cold outside. Right. Um, and it's Tokyo. So we're not talking we're not talking about South Japan where it might be warmer. Um, so about 6 p.m., the family went shopping, and let's see, and then they came home, and everything's fine. Uh, around 10.38, Mikio had been reading a work-related email, which was password protected. Only he could access it. Therefore, they knew they were alive at at least 10.38 p.m. Then there was some, there's a bunch of, you know, claims, and I'm not going to go with the claims. However, at 11.30 p.m., the family over here, the, 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 the her mom's family, Stated they heard a loud bang coming from the, uh, the, uh, the Miyazawa home. They weren't sure what it meant. Television's on. They're like, whatever. They apparently, in this house, they have this, on the second floor, they have this fold-down stairs, which is really weird, but it's a thing. And it kind of can go, boom, boom, boom. So they probably just thought, yeah, maybe it's just the stairs. So they didn't pay attention. Nobody heard screaming at all. So in the morning at 11 a.m., Yasuko's mother tried calling them to make plans, and nobody answered the phone. So she went over there. Um, actually, it said the, uh, the phone lines have been cut. Hmm. Oh, no, no. The killer unplugged the phone line. She went next door, rang the bell. No answer. She used her own key. So the door was locked. Okay. She let herself in. And she found a Mikio, uh, or Mikio, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, at the bottom of the staircase leading to the second story. Um, and he, of course, had been stabbed to death. Uh, she called out to the fa family, got no reply. She went upstairs, found the bodies of Yusuko. Uh, and Nina, the, to the, the mom and daughter, um, and they have been stabbed even more violently than the, than the father. Um, and she did touch them um, and try to look at them. And then she went into the bedroom where the little boy was, and she found him on his bed. He'd been strangled, and there was no blood there. So that's why um, the theory from the police is that the guy came through the second story window into the bathroom and went directly into the boy's room, which was right next to it, and strangled him. Um, and that, that's why there's no blood. Then he went downstairs and I think he attacked at that point, they believe he attacked the father. Uh, and, and then he went upstairs to attack the mom and daughter and his knife broke, uh, as it happened so many times with killers. I have, I've heard this story more than once. I guess they're so into it. They hit bone or something and the knife breaks. It's like, ah, oh, crap. So he goes back downstairs to the kitchen to get another knife. And, the, and like upstairs, it's the two of them think he's leaving and they try to come down to, I guess, take care of a wound on the little, little girl. And then he kills them there. So then they're killed. So um, let's see. I'm trying to. Let's see. Da, 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 da. I'm trying to see where they were actually killed. Um, oh, no, no. They went back up. So they went. They I guess they I'm trying to figure out if they went back upstairs. I'm sorry. I just I missed this point here. Well, they were found upstairs. I say little bits of different information here. But anyway, they're all dead. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, 
Now, uh, he also seemed to try to, in this version here, it seems like the one child was face down. Another one seemed to be covered with a futon, um, a blanket over one. So there was that kind of covering of the bodies, um, which some profilers believe means that the person either knew them or felt bad about it at the end and covered them up. Um, so it's really hard to get into the mind of killers on that. It's hard to say. Um, and I don't think it necessarily points dramatically in one direction. But there are things here that do dramatically point in a specific direction. So anyway, it says here the subsequent police investigation found over 12,545 pieces of evidence. Fingerprints, footprints, feces in the bathroom, clothes. He actually took all his clothes off and, and changed into the, the father's clothes, um, except for the shoes. Um, he left the murder weapon there. He left his clothes there. The sashimi knife that he brought, that he used. Um, <laughs> so tons of evidence. All right. So now... What was the theory here? I'll, I'll give you the general theory that they say. Uh, the killer entered through, through the bathroom and turned right to go to Ray's room, who was the first in the family to be killed by being strangled. Mikio was in the study room on the first floor, heard a noise, and went to check on it. As the killer exits Ray's room, he sees Mikio, I think, at the bottom of the stairs. Although this one says at the top of the stairs. So I say it's a little confusing. They have a, a oh, in this version, there's an altercation at the top of the stairs and eventually the, uh, the killer stabs him with a sashimi knife and either throws Mikio down the stairs or he falls down the stairs. So he ends up at the bottom. So okay, that, that's a theory. The killer then went on to attack Nina and Yasuko, but retreated after the sashimi knife broke. At this point, Yasuko, uh, Yasuko found a first aid kit to tend her daughter's wounds, thinking the killer had given up. However, this was not the case and the killer came back from the kitchen with a knife from their own home. So, um, and they th think that they also try to hide upstairs in the room um, because some of the uh, there was blood hidden on a, on a futon up there. So anyway, this is the limited stuff I have on the theory. Okay. Um, there was more stab wounds on the females um, than, the, than the male. Now, does this, does this show aggression toward females over the male? Um, or what, was he just pissed off he broke the knife? <laughs> Because I have another case. It's exactly what happened. The guy broke his knife. After he broke his knife and went to get a woman's knife, he went to town on her because he was just annoyed. So, or that they were trying to escape or, or it could be that when he attacked the father, he just got lucky and killed him quickly and he didn't have to worry about it. Some wounds were postmortem supposedly on the male and female. I mean, I'm sorry, on the females. So it's possible too, once you get into it, you're having a good time. You just can't stop. So you, you know, you keep going. Um, now, uh, after the killings, so then they say, think he lurked around the house and there's a, there's, there's an argument over the six, seven hours or 10 hours. Okay. But it's also possible it says that he could have escaped during the night, which you would think makes more sense. There was an issue over the, the, he said he went on to the internet and supposedly opened up, made a file, which makes little sense. And supposedly tried to book some theater tickets to the family, which also doesn't really make sense. Uh, but supposedly in the morning, the computer the computer went off and then it came back on in the morning. So there's this argument over whether he was still there or the mother came in and accidentally did touch something or kicked something in and it set it off again. I would think he would not wait till morning. I find that hard to believe. You don't wait till the sun comes up after you kill four people. You get out of there when it's dark. But he was there a while, which is why they call him the Goldilocks guy. What did he do after he killed them? Which is fascinating. All right. So he uh, he did have this problem. He cut himself. Um, and so he used uh, things to you know try to stem the bleeding, including a sanitary pad he found from, I guess, the mom's cabinet. Because those actually work really well. And some people even think that's um, another, another clue because... Uh, I guess in the Marines have found out that that's really good on a, on a battlefield because they're so they're so absorbent, especially you use the you know the full ones. Um, so you can put that on there and really you know stem the bleeding and have you know not have it keep drip, dripping. So he did he he fixed up his hand in some fashion to keep it from bleeding. Now there's an argument. Well, I, I see that supposedly it was a deep wound. I don't know that it was. They weren't there to see how deep it was. He had some of his blood obviously in the house. Um, but, you know, it's hard to say whether he cut into himself like this or he slashed across. Um, how bad was it? I don't know. Uh, wasn't bad enough that he didn't hang around for more hours. And, and as it says here, he helped himself to uh, four bottles of barley tea. 
four ice cream cups, some say three, ice cream cups. He ate ice cream while, afterwards. Uh, one ice cream counter was found on the bathtub on the second floor. One another one on the cushion in the living room. And two more were piled up on the side of the computer. <laughs> he was really hanging around. Now, some people say maybe there's three people. Maybe it's three people that were there, which is why everybody shared ice cream. Uh, but nobody else's, nothing from any other uh, killer was there, uh, evidence-wise. There was a story about this taxi driver said there were these three guys who got in his taxi, I guess in the morning or something, and they didn't say much, and one of the guys left blood in his, his, um, uh, in his taxi. Turned out it wasn't blood. It's like chocolate or something. So I don't think there's anybody there but this guy. But he was just hungry. <laughs> Hungry and thirsty, he'd done a lot of work, and he's going to chuck down some some drinks. What's interesting is that there was also beer in there, and there was also sodas. But he went for uh, he prefer, he preferred the um, barley tea, which is interesting when we talk about who is this guy? Um, is he full Japanese? Uh, there's there's claims that he's half Japanese, and so maybe he's even an American. You know, so maybe he. But he, you know, what he's eating, what he's drinking there is barley tea, which is interesting. And then, of course, the ice cream. Now, um, after he went to the computer and ate his ice cream, uh, then he um, he also trashed the place. He looked for, he went through a whole bunch of stuff. He spread out personal documents, diaries, identification cards, utility bills, bank books, and other documents in the dining room table and on the sofa. Uh, the second floor bathtub was filled with documents, receipts, towels, sanitary products, and other garbage. Then he left the feces in the bathroom. Um, so he also, um, he went into uh, uh, Mikio's and Yosuko's wallets and he emptied them. Um, he, but he didn't take, he took some money, but he didn't take all their stuff and his, or their bank cards. He left everything like that. So the concept is, this is a burglar. But if the burglar is a weird burglar, you know, and, and the other concept is, somebody was really looking for something. They needed some document and they were just searching the house for the document. Um, which I guess is possible, but, you know, it seems like you'd find a better time than murdering the entire family to try to find that document. Uh, but they, they couldn't figure out anything that was really particularly missing. Um, and then I, some, I also heard some places that there was water in the bathtub and so uh, and some places I have heard there isn't. So anyway, the guy just 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 shredded the house, going, going through all kinds of stuff, almost seeming, in a sense, haphazardly in one area, and more like, uh, why would he even look at all their stuff in another area? Um, very hard to say. Uh, they did test the feces and found that he had eaten a sp sesame spinach dish with string beans that had been consumed somewhere else. The type of food, something that a mother would make for their sons. Uh, so again, he's eating either Japanese food or Korean food, something Asian as opposed to American. Um, and, you know, something you might eat at home, not a hamburger, you know, you got out at a McDonald's, but you know, home cooked type food. And also he took a nap on the couch <laughs> in the living room. So that's why they call him the Goldilocks guy. All right. So that's the basics of how bizarre this case is. Um, so I want to go into some of the different theories. Oh, uh oh, wait a minute. Let me do. I'll, I'll check on some of your comments and then I'll go into the DNA issues and the fingerprint issue. Because those are those are important. Um, all right, let me just say hello to you in, in the chat room and see if we have any interesting comments. Um, yeah, uh, Andini says it's crazy that there's all this DNA evidence and the case hasn't been solved. Do you know why it hasn't been solved with DNA? All right, there's a couple of reasons for that. As far as they have his actual 100% DNA, um, this isn't a case. Yeah, they have his DNA. However. Um, in Japan, supposedly, you can only check DNA against DNA. In other words, if you catch somebody, you get their DNA, you may check that. They don't have a bank where you can check it against all the, as far as I know, like that. Um, and I don't know that that's allowed to be taken to other countries. So there's a whole thing about the DNA issue, not being able to be checked in certain ways. Um, they also don't have familial DNA there. So otherwise, they might be able to to connect it to a cousin or, or, or a brother or somebody who's been in the criminal justice system, but they don't have that. Uh, if you're Japanese, you can update me because I really don't know. But so far, he's that DNA has not been matched to anybody. Absolutely. Um, they also have his fingerprints. Now in Japan, there apparently adults, their fingerprints are on record. 
Um, so in Korea, everybody's fingerprints on record too. There. Oh, wait a minute. Japan. Wait a minute. Let me think about Japan again. Um, I don't know if it's only only. Uh, I think everybody's not kids, not children, not teens. Um, but um, I'm trying to find out where the issue is on the. Um, let me grab the uh, issue on the, the fingerprints. And the DNA. Okay, fingerprints. In 2006, the DNA of the criminal was tested against again using DNA profiling. This show. Okay, this is this shows what kind of background he has, right? The criminal is probably of mixed race. This is not actually true, and this is very important because the question has come down to is could he have been, uh, a, a, let's say, a serviceman, uh, an American um, uh, American military man on base in Japan? Could that be? Um, or could he be a visitor? It says that he had mixed uh, mixed race. Mixed race is not, you know, we're not talking 50-50 here. And that's what I first thought when I read this. It says here, the maternal DNA indicated his mother was of European descent, possibly from a South European country near the Mediterranean or Adriatic Sea. However, it is considered possible that the European mat maternal DNA comes from a distant ancestor from the mother's line. So in other words, she could look Japanese or she could look Korean or she could look any other Asian, but way, 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 way back, somebody, you know, had themselves a wife from another or a husband from another spot, you know, let's see, it's so a maternal line. So I'm trying to figure that out. Um, so it could be her great, great, great grandmother. And so she, he himself, the killer could look Japanese. Now, uh, his paternal DNA indicated his father of an East Asian descent. Analysis said that he had a particular chromosome um, that appears in four, one in four or five Koreans, one in 10 Chinese, and one in 13 Japanese. So the police said it's more likely his father was Korean than the others. Okay, it is more likely one out of four as opposed to one out of 10 or one out of 12, but I'm sorry, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put a lot of weight on that because one out of twelve isn't bad either. Think about it. You've got a you have a you have a, a a town and it's got 120 people in it. And one out of four means one of those 30 people could be who that you know your daddy, but one out of 12, 10 of them could be your daddy. So I mean it's not like it's so tiny. So to me, is the percentage higher toward Korean? Yes. A little higher toward Chinese, yes. And a little less high toward Japanese, yes, but so what? It's not proof. So he is Asian, but his father was of one of the Asian groups, and we just don't know. His mother was likely also Asian with some Mediterranean background somewhere. So I don't think we're looking for a mixed race person who's you know half and half. We're not. We're looking for probably somebody who looks just like everybody else. Why is that important? Because when you've got a mass murder in a home like this, you, you bet anybody who looks that different, people are going pointing fingers. Yeah, I know it's that guy over there. <laughs> yeah, don't look like us. Yeah, that kind of thing will happen. But apparently that's not what's happening here. So there's not any absolute, we went after all these guys or half whatever. So I think that's a little, yeah. And that's 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 what I say um, down under. Uh, the differences aren't big enough to be any way definitive. No, it, it's, it's something to look at, but it's whatever. Um, oh, that's, that's, uh, Benny, did you say this? Let me, let me look here. It uh, does not explain why Ray was strangled instead of being stabbed. I also, I don't think Ray saw him because he's supposed to enter the kid's red, the kid's room and strangled him. That's correct, Benny. He probably was asleep. As far as we know, they were, everybody but daddy was asleep. Why did he strangle him and not stab him? It could simply be that he didn't want them, that kid to scream before he went to the next room. It could be just that. Um, but there was no blood on him. So it's obvious he didn't kill everybody else and then go up there and then strangle him because he had blood. Out. He, he was like bathing in blood of his own and the others. So he definitely was strangled. Um, and who knows? He could, he, you point out something. He could have walked in the room and as he came to the bed and picked, to the, you know, whatever, he was, maybe I still had his knife in his, wherever he had his knife at, and was going to reach for it. And the kid's eyes popped open. He just went like this. Who knows? Who knows? We just know they're dead. So that's kind of more important. Um, uh, Vera, Vera says, if this person were to travel to the USA, for example, and go through immigration where he would get fingerprinted and entered into the database, would USA share criminal records with police in Japan? 
And if you're Japanese, you might want to answer this. And if you're us, you can answer this too. There's so the theory is yes. Some stuff, some of the stuff was checked through Interpol. I, okay, wait a minute. I do believe DNA was checked through Japan, Interpol. So yeah, and, and nothing came up. So the guy has never been arrested any place else. So um, as far as the fingerprints go, um, I'm not sure how how well they share all this stuff and how much energy they put into it 20 years later. But yeah, um, but he hasn't popped up any place. Let's put it that way. So far, his fingerprints haven't matched anybody. The DNA hasn't matched anybody. So that's why they don't know who it is. Um, and that for all the people they interviewed and asked for fingerprints of or DNA, of, it didn't match them. So it's kind of just crazy. Hi, Cheryl. Cheryl's a Cheryl has just dropped in. Okay, let me go. Okay, so when we don't know his DNA, I'm going to say he's probably mostly Asian. So one of the theories I looked at just in my own head was since this is a U.S. military there, is it possible that a son of a U.S. military guy um, went and killed somebody and then got out of the country? And there's also an interesting point about in his, his little, he had a fanny pack, which he also left there. He kind of doesn't like to take things with him had some sand in it and this one of the places the sand, there were only two places the sand could come from one of them was in the united states um near the uh it was um in california in the mojave desert near the air base um so the question is well maybe the guy was from the air base you know or you know, whatever um but again um then is it possible that an american uh could be over stationed in japan who is actually Asian. I mean, there are Asians in this country, Amer Asian Americans who join the military. It's possible. And his wife could be also Asian, with a little bit of Mediterranean thing rolling. But if you're talking about a, uh, if you're talking about a full, uh, let's not say full, but if you're talking about, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's, it's possible. It's possible. Or, you know, you could have a, a white uh, white American military man. You could have a black military man. Uh, his wife could be Asian. His wife could be from the Mediterranean. I mean, you could go through all these uh, machinations. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot down the whole, the whole San and California thing anyway. So I don't think this has anything to do with a military man from the U.S. Um, I just don't. Because I think what we have is a local uh, who lives it was near enough to these people. Uh, who looks enough like these people to get around town and nobody particularly pays them on to him. So, um, and that would be true. A psychopath roaming free, right? <laughs> he could have stolen the pack. No, actually their evidence was all, it's, there was no other DNA or anything else on the pack that came from any other human being, but himself. And there's, you have to go to these two locations and get all these details. There's a lot, a lot of levels of details of, of uh, most of the stuff that he was wearing. I'm going to show you some pictures of what he was wearing. Um, because this, this is what they thought he looked like. The guy, he had this hat, he had a jacket, he had a scarf. The guy was like <laughs> overdressed when he came. Um, and there are these different pictures of what he looked like, what he was wearing. Because he left the pants, I, I, did he leave the pants? I think so. Uh, the pants, I'm not sure about the pants, maybe he kept the pants. Uh, but the shirt was there. I, I have all the information here. A second, um, there's his fanny pack that they believe it was. Um, and here's some information on this. He wore a crusher hat. Uh, and there were like, they said here, there were 3,000 some uh, of these crusher hats around. They were sold primarily in the Kanto region. So this was a Japanese set. So he would have bought those in Japan. Um, and those, those, those gloves, those were the, the gloves he wore. They were also from, they were also local. Um, he wore a scarf. Let's see, only, a, let's see, what about the scarf? Uh, not too much information on the scarf here. Oh, this is a picture of, he had handkerchiefs. He had these two black handkerchiefs and he, and he, 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 he um, tied them around the knife in a way that they thought was very interesting, uh, very unique. In other words, it's a way because a knife is too hard to hold on to. You tie that around there so it makes a thicker handhold. It's used by people in restaurants and it's used by military. So a bunch of people use that technique. But not everybody knows that technique. I, I'm going to that I think is a big piece of information, and I will refer to that in my in profile of the guy. Uh, he wore a jacket, uh, an air tech jacket, um, eighty-two thousand sold. Um, and then in the jacket pocket, there was from the Mura Prince uh, uh, Peninsula, 
Okay, and then there were these dead leaves and some feces of birds. They, no, they really scraped these things. Um, so there was sand here that was supposedly from the coast of this peninsula. Um, then there was a shirt that's called a raglan shirt that was only available in a certain, certain shop and only 130 were sold. They only identified 20, 12 of the people who bought them. Very popular with young people. Those were the shoes he wore and they were made in Korea. Um, but you, you saw, that was interesting. The perfume, this perfume was called the Dracar Noir, a manufactured by a guy Laroche in France. And it was on sale in 1982. And um, is very popular with skateboarders <laughs> because a popular American professional skateboarder advertised it. And so the, the boys started wearing that stuff. Um, then this is his fanny pack or hip bag. It was worn out, so it had been used for a while. Um, some evidence that, uh, let's see, that a piece of grip tape to the surface of skateboards was in there, um, trace elements of the, the, the cologne. And then there were two strands of black hair in there. Uh, yeah, okay. And look at that. So those are some of the things that were there. Most of them were bought in Japan, um, pretty much. So, except the Korean shoes that weren't sold in Japan at the time, the size that was that they were. Um, so, but you could order them. Or they had to come from Korea. And this, I think, is a good piece of information, too. So, I like the piece of information about the sand from the peninsula. I like the information about the... Um, the shoes that might be from Korea. I like the information about the knife, which was a, um, let me tell you, that type of knife was a, where's the information on the knife? Um, the knife was, it was a knife used to um, chop up fish. Um, uh, let me, where the heck is the knife? Sashimi knife, it's a sashimi knife, okay. Um, a sashimi knife that was wrapped in this, this methodology to make a thicker thing used in a professional sense, generally speaking. I think that's very important. So again, um, the shoes from Korea, the sand from the, what I believe is from the peninsula and not from the U.S. I think that whole thing is a wild goose chase that, you know, is similar to that one place in the Mojave Desert. And it's just to think that some guy who did this crime has been running back and forth across and, and coming into countries and, I just don't buy it. And then we have um, the knife and the way it was wrapped. And the clothing is, I say, generally speaking, local and popular among skateboarders. So all of that's very important. Also, the fact that he eats local food. Uh, he ate what looked like a home-cooked Asian food, which would be Korean or Jap Japanese, that kind, of, uh, that kind of food. So, so far, I'm not seeing a, a foreigner. And I'm not seeing a, a, a person who is foreign, so foreign. And I mean so foreign by saying they're from Europe or from the U.S. and have U.S. or, for, or, or um, European ways, shall we say, or from South America or Mexico. I just don't see that. I think he's Asian through and through. And um, the local police chief is like, yeah, this is, you know, um, the thing he doesn't like. He said everything about him, like reads this, could be Asian. But he goes, but this is just not an Asian crime. <laughs> and it may just be because he doesn't want to admit that somebody from you know, his own country, Japan, would do something horrible like this. Better to blame it on somebody else. So, all right. So we have, he's not in the fingerprint database any place. He's not in a DNA database data any place. In 20 years, he's never showed up in one. Okay. So there are some theories. And I, I want to go through the different theories, and I'll tell you my theory. Now, let me just check on your comments for a second so I can have a... Getting thirsty. Um, I wonder... Um, Lauren says, I wonder if those shirts were only sold in store as it was such a small batch. I wonder if a store employee may be able to remember a customer. They have had, this is one of the, they, they checked so many people in this case. I mean, absolutely. They went, I have to say, it sounds like the police worked their butts off to ask, talk to everybody. But what happens sometimes, hold on. What happens sometimes is, when you have that many police officers interviewing that many people, the, uh, it becomes overload of information. And, and each, each police officer or detective asks things in a different way, writes it down in a slightly different way. Um, and depending on when you catch that person, you talk to them, are they telling the truth? Are they not telling the truth? Do they simply not remember? But they never came up with a name connected to that. They actually had a, 
as far as a sashimi knife, they found one location. I think he said this in the, um, uh, the, the podcast that in some store where there was food being sold and other things, some guy went in and just bought the sashimi knife. And you go, oh, you know, he's what didn't care about buying anything else in that store, just wanted that knife. Supposedly there was a camera, some kind of video, and they claimed it was not this guy. So whether they were able to catch up with him and, and, and it was not anybody who could, could have committed the crime, but it wasn't him. So they don't know where the sashimi rife came. Uh, the child is just a child. He's only five. He just, you know, didn't, I guess he just did a perfect speech, but that doesn't, probably doesn't make any difference in the crime unless the speech guy came in to work with him was the killer. So, um, okay. So let's go to, <laughs> if he was young, he may not have even known he was using a sanitary pad. He might've thought it was some type of bandage. <laughs> Could be true. Actually, that's not, not, that's not impossible. Um, the only product, um, uh, as far as the Korean products go, uh, only the shoes, they were supposedly Korean shoes that were not sold in Japan, but you could buy them, I guess, mail order. So, um, interesting. Uh, let's see. Vera says, I thought it might be a local chef who served the family because of the sashimi knife. Um, uh, Miranda's saying, I think it was an older teenager or in her early 20s. Elisa says, I don't see an older person like me coming into the window to the house because that was there was supposedly kind of a lot of work to that. Like behind the house, there was a tree and you had to kind of climb up the tree and then get over the fence. And then you had to get up on this spot here and you climb up to something. I think I forgot what he climbed up. Oh, this is the front of the house. Do I have the back? Let me see. Uh, what is this picture? Um, that's a skateboard. That's a skateboard park. Um, let's see if I have the back of the house. So this is a picture of the, this is the house today. Poor sad thing. It just sits there like that in the park looking all dilapidated. That's, that's pretty, pretty, yeah, sad. Um, what is this? Oh, this is, okay, this is, this is a picture from, uh, this would be, we behind, this would be behind the house, right? I think. So I'm not quite sure where the window is, to tell you the truth, um, and how it quite he got up there, but I would say you're correct that the guy was athletic enough to be able to sort of jump up on things pretty quickly, which would lean toward him being younger. Than, than older. Um, and there's elements of this crime which definitely lean that way. So one of the, so let's go to some of the theories just because there, there are some crazy theories in this. Um, uh, the theory, this guy puts in the podcast, theory one, the killer is a Korean since it's more likely the killers from Korea than Japan. So we're talking one out of four. Not just DNA, he had the Slasinger tennis shoes in a size nine, not available for sale in Japan. So the chief of police thought he wasn't culturally Japanese because he said, you don't do this kind of crime, right? <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, police worked hard on this angle. All fingerprints of all citizens 17 and over in South Korea were available. Um, now, point I want to point this out, 17 and over. So if the guy, if the guy had been in Korea and been 17 or older when he was in Korea, whether it be three years before the crime or three weeks before the crime, his fingerprints would be on record. However, keep this in mind, if he were just at the time of the crime or the time when they checked the, the, the fingerprints, if he was 16 at the time when he left Korea, his fingerprints wouldn't be on file there. He could have come over and been hanging around for whatever amount of time and turned 17 in Japan. And Japan does not have, uh, as far as I know, a whole thing of fingerprints for every. Uh, I'm trying to again remember this part. Um, so there may be no fingerprints of this guy because of his age, which means he would be younger. All right. Um, okay. Japanese can run fingerprints, and they had no match. They also also since 2007, vi visitors have to give fingerprints. But again, it's not children or teens. It's, you have to be over a certain age, which will be about 17. So again, if you came to visit Japan and you were 16, you don't have your fingerprints there. Um, so the killer has never committed another crime in Japan that, other, that otherwise they would check his fingerprints against um, the records if he committed a crime. However, uh, the, I read a place where it said if, cert, if you were a certain age when you committed the crime in Japan, they may not have taken your fingerprints. So let's say you're a 13, they wouldn't do it. So again, 
uh, and I don't know how much is accurate on the internet that I've been trying to find out about the fingerprint issue. So if you're Japanese, shoot it down into the comments and I will, you know, be happy to hear them because this is a curious part. All right. Um, so anyway, there was this journalist and he wrote a book. Uh, said that there was a former South Korean Air Force man turned killer for hire. He had a, he, uh, <laughs> and supposedly this guy oh, it's hired from Korea to speed up the demolition of the home. In other words, they want these people out. So they hired this Korean hitman, and and he um, came, um, he, he killed his family, and then he supposedly came back in 2015 for another hit, and he's based out of Bangkok. Okay. <laughs> this is not a hit. This is not the way hitmen work. <laughs> no hitman that comes here and leaves all his evidence in there and spends six hours in the house. This is not a hit. This is, this is the most ludicrous hit I, I can even imagine. So the hitman thing is just stupid. We can just we can dump that really quickly. And I don't think the place that wants to move move them out can't offer them a little bit more money to get them to move. And they were planning to move anyway. So and then they they, they were not ready to move. And the next door, they were still there. What? Why didn't they kill the next door people? If you're going to kill one half of the one house, why don't you kill the other relatives? <laughs> so that does not make sense. All right. Theory two. Well, no, what happened to theory one? Wait a minute. That was theory two. What did he have for theory one? Hold on a second. Mm, oh, burglar. And it, that's not a normal burglar either. He left all kinds of stuff of worth. Took some money, but didn't take all the money. Didn't take the jewelry. Didn't take it. And burglars don't hang around for six hours. They get the crap and they get out of there. So burglar is pretty, pretty nonsensical. Now let's, let me say what, um, let me refer to David Cantor because he asked him about the burglary thing. David Cantor said, burglars usually avoid entering properties with people. I mean, you want the stuff. You don't want to have to deal with killing people because that's a lot more work and it gives you a lot longer sentence. I mean, if you're caught burglarizing, a lot of these days you've got a really tiny sentence, but you kill four people off to get some money or whatever. It's, now, sometimes a drug user will, will go in a frenzy thing, desperate, but a regular burglar, no, not any experience. He says, they're not all to kill all of them, be strange, not any experienced burglar. Um, then he then he's asked, what, could it have been an opportunistic burglar turned killer? No, again. And could he have staged it look like a robbery? Well, again, it's too sloppy. Um, did he, David Kanner says, maybe taking a souvenir like American killers. I'm sorry, David Kanner. I'm not sure why American killers are the only ones that take souvenirs, but and that's very rare anyway. Um, so he says, he, he says it's not desperation to get money. That drug addict again would grab the money and just run off to get the drugs. So I agree with David Cantor on his burglar. No, not a burglar. Um, let's see if David Cantor said anything about the uh, the uh, other, the theory of the hitman. Um, no, he doesn't say anything about that. Okay, we go to let's go to theory three. More than one person. Remember those three guys in a in a in the taxi. This is not a three person crime. It's too messed up. It's too confusing, and only one person stuff is there. So that does not make any sense um, at all. Um, let's go to their theory four. Um, um, one thing David Cantor said was he was very relaxed about the killing and not and uh, you know. In other words, you know, after he killed four people, he didn't have a problem just hanging around and sleeping and eating food, even with, even with a cut hand. He was just like, yeah, I'm going to just hang around for a while. And there is a good question. Was he hanging around for a reason? Like he need, somebody was going to come pick him up or he was waiting to, one theory is he was waiting to catch a train and the trains don't start till morning, had to stay someplace. So he stayed there and in the morning he just, you know, he changed his clothes, wore, wore daddy's clothes, and then just walk out and get on a train. That's very possible. I, I, I'm not against that theory. There was supposedly this. There was supposedly a theory that the, there was a guy seen uh, 200 miles, 200 miles to the north, I think it was, and and some guy in the station saw said he saw a guy with a cut hand down to the bone, and he asked where he could go to find a doctor or something, and then that guy disappeared. Has never been seen. Um, I would think if the guy cut his hand down to the bone. He's not going to be having a bandage off of it. He's going to have it wrapped in something. And I don't know that he's going to, you know, it, it didn't sound like he was running around saying, look at my, look at this. I don't know. It, the one story was a little questionable. One of the reasons they considered it as this could be the guy is because it was like up in the mountains and it was a really rough, rugged place. And maybe the guy then just ran off into the mountains and died in a, you know, some ravine and 
They've just never found him. And that's why he's never committed another crime and he just died out there. Uh, I'm, I, uh, it's only one guy who claimed made this claim and I don't know how valid it was. They checked it out. They, the police didn't seem to go crazy about it. So let's go to, let's go to the fourth one. Um, where's the, okay, theory two is that one. Lots of theories. Um, uh, okay. Oh, this is that that place. Oh, it's 100 miles to the north, by the way. It's a town called Nikki or something like that. A train employee said he saw a guy with a, a deep hand wound. But the police don't buy this as the killer. But the th theory that he could have waited in the, in, in, in the house until the train started up, that does make sense. Because when I lived in Denmark, um, when I was going to college there, one of the problems was at about, I forgot what time it was. I think it was like one o'clock, the train stopped running and they started up at five o'clock. So what would happen is you'd be out drinking with your friends and about 12 o'clock you get, uh, you, you got tired. No, 1230, one o'clock comes and you're kind of, you're tired, but you're still having fun. And you go, should I just jump on the train now and go home? Or should I just keep partying till two, three, four in the morning and I'll go home at five. And at some point you still feel energetic. So you let that one o'clock hour slip by and about two o'clock you think, oh my God, why did I do this? <laughs> and it's torture to get through the next three hours. Sometimes you go to some place and have some food to eat and you just try to slump in a seat. Oh, and those three hours were so long before the, finally the stupid train started up. Now, theoretically, could you just uh, hire a taxi to get back home? Yes, if you had the money, but I didn't have the money to pay that. So I, I did that once and I had to take the train back home at, in the morning. And there were a lot of a lot of students like half asleep on the train and they'd go, wake me up at the last, the, the second to last stop. Because you know? <laughs> they were drunk and tired. Um, so could this guy have done that? I can, I can see that makes sense. That I kind of like. All right. The next big theory is the skateboarder. All right. And there's a really good reason for the skateboarder theory. One is he had complained about the, the skateboard, the skateboarding and the noise. Now, when that happens, that is an event that happened prior to the murders. Secondly, he had that tape or whatever, that was something that was used in, in skateboarding. Uh, it's claimed he wore skateboarding kind of clothes. Now, there's some skateboarders who say, no, those aren't the things we wore. And I don't know if that's true or they just don't want to admit this guy was a skateboarder maybe. Um, so, but there were reasons to think he could be a skateboarder. And the pure perfume was worn by the skateboarding advertising guy and, and skateboarders will like to wear it because of that. So he's got a bunch of things that could link him to skateboarding, along with the style of the crime, the crime being frenzied and kind of careless. And the guy didn't, didn't, clearly this wasn't a clever, uh, clever um, killer. He didn't plan this out well. You know, he got hurt. He left all this evidence there. A, you know, he stayed when somebody could have shown up. And I, I don't see that as an older person. I see that as a, as a more of a teenager to young 20. So whoever said that is correct. I think that's that range. Uh, Some are late teens to early 20s. Somebody who, psychopathic teen, who has an odd anger at the world. And um, who knows what he's done before? Did he kill animals? Did he set little fires? Uh, I, I believe a disturbed family life where this family is the epitome of perfection and he's all pissed off at the world and his family sucks. So, Hey, or he doesn't have a daddy. He only has a mom, you know, maybe the mom who cooked him this little food, but daddy's not around or daddy's missing half of the year. Uh, maybe he, he's angry about something and he picks his family as I'm going to go have this thrill kill. And he's able, he's, he's young enough to be able to jump up a tree. And if, if you're a skateboarder, you're probably pretty athletic. And I mean, I watch skateboarders. I'm like, holy crap. The things they do are amazing. You know, things that would, now I'd break my neck in a second with, but even when I was that age, I would break my, sec, my, my neck. They're good at what they do. And they're used to falling and tumbling and jumping. And that a skateboarder would be the perfect guy to go behind his house and yeah. So, and there was a skateboard park right there and he had issues with it. So they, they questioned the heck out of the skateboarders, came up with nothing that, that theoretically was not one of the skateboarders. They didn't know who else it could be. Although some skateboarders did not like to cooperate with the police because they were those young little supposedly semi-hooligans, um, even in Japan. Um, 
And also, by the way, this was kind of a time when when they started doing where more teens were getting into the thrill kill type of thing across the world. So if you were in a group that wasn't as doing as well in life as a teenager in school or with your family, um, you know, you might be out there skateboarding and, and you might have one of those people among the skateboarders uh, might be the guy that's messed up. I th I'm trying to remember what it is in gaming, for example. I was doing an investigation of a, what a, a person I believe was a gamer and that had gone and gotten certain stuff from certain shops. So I went to talk to people in the shops and they're like, you know, of course they're like, Hey, most of us are great guys. But then they, I think they use the term, this was years ago. I think they use the term tweaker. He must've been a tweaker. In other words, yeah, he did gaming, but that guy, <laughs> we didn't like him. So it could be the same situation here. So you got a lot of guys who have fun together. All that, then there can be those other ones. Now, so they investigated this, but they didn't come up with, they didn't come up with proof that one of the skateboarding guys or anybody they knew was the guy. But is that the right kind of place to look? My opinion is yes. That was the right age group with a lot of similar, young, the young clothing, um, the, the things that match that kind of group. Now, just because he has, he does have that skateboardery stuff and the, you know, the, the cologne and stuff doesn't mean he's a skateboarder. He could be somebody lurking on the, the fringes. He could be somebody who watches them as aware of them. He does stuff, he doesn't love the group. Um, so that's why they're not that familiar with him. He could have been somebody who used to skateboard and then, you know, who knows? And that's the problem. The police, God love them. They People don't understand some of these things when they start attacking the police for failing. Oh, my God, the amount of work they have to do and the amount of leads they have to follow. So the skateboarder thing, let's see what else they said. Um, so uh, they were this guy was saying here, 1990s, the skateboarding was kind of an underground thing. Kid or teen, wasting time. Teen bums, a subculture. Also street uh, skaters and messed up, mess up. Oh, some, oh, they like to skate late at night. So this is one of the problems that uh, uh, the, the father had that they, you know, they're trying to go to sleep. My kids are trying to go to sleep and the skate, skateboard park is right behind them. And they're, and they're also probably voicing loudly. Uh, I had some people move in next door to me, some students, and they played, um, they like to play um, horseshoes in their backyard. But unfortunately their backyard lined up with the, just the left side of my bedroom window. And of course they went out, they didn't go out at five in the afternoon. They got drunk off their asses. <laughs> and then when they got really drunk, they came out and threw the stupid horseshoes. And I'm, I'm trying to go to bed at midnight and I'm hearing clink, clink, clink. Oh, I was so glad when they moved. But if they're trying to sleep, take care of kids, and these guys are out there shouting or sh laughing loudly, you can get really annoyed. So that's why they looked at these. Um, they were, they were forbidden to skate at night, but that didn't mean that didn't happen. And they also said some came from, from afar, afar. So you know that train issue? It's very possible the guy jumped a train because just because you're on a train doesn't mean you're come, you know, you're go going um, for a, a 200 mile ride. You could be going for a 10 mile ride, going from just one town to the next. Maybe where you're staying at, there are no skateboard parks. And so you jump the train to get up there and, and do that. Um, so they and they so them came in at night, um, but it says they were heavily investigative. Uh, investigated, didn't find anybody. All right, now I think it's a real that is a very very important thing. Now let me let me go again. Oh, another the possibility that it is possible the guy could have dressed this way to look like a skateboarder, like as a disguise. I don't like that theory because. He, if he's, he's breaking in at night, nobody's seeing him anyway. So I don't know if it really matters how brilliant a disguise he had. Um, the black handkerchiefs, I'll point this again because I might have said this incorrectly. Um, the black handkerchiefs were Japanese. They were used to wrap around the knife. Police wondered if it was a technique. Chinese and Philippines used the messes in a factory to keep the wrap from slipping when you're cutting stuff. Um, the sashimi knife. Um, I think that's very important. Um, so theory five. Oh, a member of the military base from Edwards Air Force Base in California posted in Japan who had some sand. I just don't go for it. Now, 
Okay. Um, does he have a six before I go into my theory? <laughs> um, no, I think that was, I thought he had six. Maybe he's only got five. Um, all right. There's one other place that the sand could come from. And that makes a whole lot more sense because think of it this way. Although things can get very elaborate, a lot of things are much simpler. In this particular case, and I'll, re I'll read what uh, David Kanner says, um, that very possible, he also agrees that it sounds more teenagery, this crime, uh, or early 20s, teenager, early 20s, because it's very impulsive. And all the stuff he does is just not, most of it doesn't make a lot of sense out of, oh, I think I'm going to do that now. So it seems more of a teenage sort. Now, who could that teenager be? Okay. Here's my theory on that. And then I'll go to your comments on what you think my theory holds any water. <laughs> okay. So um, I want to point out this place. It is known as, a, I don't know how to pronounce it, Miura Peninsula in the Kanagawa Prefecture is an enjoyable day trip from Tokyo. That's where the sand there, that's two, the, two, the two places the sand, that kind of sand was at, was there in the Mojave Desert. Now, if you're going to pick one, go for Oakham's Razor. Do you think the guy got it from the United States in the Mojave Desert or a quick train ride down to the peninsula in Japan, just south of Tokyo? I'm going to go with that one. So let's take a look at this. Um, um, and there you see, let's see. Oh, I want to show this picture. Uh, yeah. Okay. So Tokyo is up there and there's the peninsula. And so and there's these all these little um, things online where you can, you know, you can get the one day trip down there and it just go down there and you have there's lots of um, there's restaurants down there. It's, it's on the sea. It's on the sea. It's, there's a port down there. And they there's um, let's see if I have the fish. Is that my fisherman thing? No. Uh, let me find my fisherman thing about the port, because I think this is interesting. Um, where is it? Oh, uh the southern tip of the Miura Peninsula, it says here, this guy's taking a trip there. And he says, lovingly referred to as Tuna Town by the locals. This cozy seaside hamlet prides itself in its high quality catches. What's more, much like the better known fish markets up in the capital, Tokyo, Misaki Port allows visitors to experience the daily tuna auctions. So, they have a lot of fishermen down there and they slice up a lot of tuna with what? Oh, maybe sashimi knives at some point. So I'm going to say, oh, there's also another thing. He had some kind of um, some, some kind of stuff in his bag, which looked like it came from those markers that you mark, you know, like a student would have markers. Um, so again, that's why they thought he might be a college student or high school student because he had these markers. Now let's look at where he is um, as far as the, this, this possible, issue of the Mirror Peninsula. If this guy had the sand, either somebody else had that, 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 that fanny pack first, even though there's nobody else's DNA on it, and they, they put the sand in there somehow with some object of theirs, or he went someplace and the, the sand got in there. And the two places he would have had to go is the Mojave Desert or the, this peninsula. All right, so I'm going to go with the peninsula because it would mean to me that's that's where he lives in the general area. Now, a couple possibilities as far as who he is and why he'd do this crime. This is a, a pretty picture perfect family. You got a guy who's a, a flaming psychopath that likes to kill. I'm going to say something's wrong with this family. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to take that, I'm going to jump to that conclusion that he hasn't been a happy camper. He hasn't grown up well. He's grown up with attachment disorder. Something's gone wrong in that family. Um, and for his life, as he's growing up, he has anger issues. He's disconnected from people. He wants to do the thrill thing. He wants, and, and the fact he goes into the house and goes to pause through all their stuff and eats their food. And he, uh, it sounds like he's experiencing a world in my opinion, he does not have, which means to me, he's not a neighbor down the street who lives in a similar situation. I would, I would profile him as someone comes from a poorer family, someone who is a worker, uh, possibly in a restaurant, 
possibly as a fisher person, somebody who uses those type of sashimi knives in their regular work. <clears throat> possible also he has worked in those industries. As a young person, he's helped out dad or mom with fish in some fashion, with fishing or with restaurant work, um, cleaning and, and cutting up and all that kind of crap. And he, I don't know that he had to go buy the knife. I think the knife was available. Um, uh, and the reason I think that this location is interesting is that it is very possible that his family could have worked there in that industry and moved up to Tokyo, or it could be that he was, he was down there with his family, came up to Tokyo himself to visit somebody or whatever, committed a crime and got on that train and went south, not north. Um, and if he was young enough, his fingerprints will not be on file. And if he came to the, uh, came to Japan young enough, again, his finger, fingerprints wouldn't be on file. So let's say his family did uh, emigrate from uh, Korea and he came with his mom and dad or mom or dad or whatever, and he's only 15. His fingerprints aren't anywhere. He enters the country, his fingerprints aren't taken. And I say, if you're Japanese and say that's not true for back then, they would have taken the children's fingerprints. Let me know, but as far as I know, that's not true. He would enter the country without having his fingerprints taken. And I don't know when he would have entered the country. If he, if he wasn't born in Japan and moved there early on with perhaps Korean parents or Chinese parents, well, then he would grow up there without fingerprints. And in and my opinion is in a and they were working in one of those industries, restaurant or or uh, or fishing, something to do with those fish and those knives. Um, and that's why he would know the wrapping of the sashimi knife as a useful tool, so you don't harm hurt yourself uh, when you're. Well, he, he did, but he was stabbing four people to death. So oh my, three, three out of three out of four, um, and you you hurt yourself more because they fight back and the the fish. Just lay there, you know, so <laughs> the fish aren't a problem, but still you can slip. Um, and so he wrapped this thing and he did slip during the uh, during the murders. Now, there's another interesting possibility. Uh, and again, if you're Japanese, you can correct me on this because I only get so much information in English. No, um, there was a point where they allowed an awful lot of people from Korea to come and stay in in um, uh, in Japan. Um, and they do a lot of the the, the labor and they're Korean Japanese now, and they're kind of complaining that they're not sometimes considered full Japanese um, as as citizens. And but they do a lot of certain labor, which might be these restaurant. There's a lot of Korean restaurant workers, and there's also the issue of uh, Chinese coming in as well. And there's and, and, and there are a number of uh, illegal aliens coming into the country Ill illegally on freighters and other ways that they sneak into the country. Again, this is a port. Um, now I look to see whether this was a major port, whether there was any uh, uh, smuggling of immigrants down there. I couldn't find that. I found it mostly fishing. But they, the location is interesting in that, it, you know, it, it's the closest port, I think, a major port, I guess, we're coming in that way to Tokyo. Um, and, and if you look at a bigger picture, um, let's see, where the heck is um, everything? Okay, so You've got you got China there and you got Korea there. They're 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 nearby and I don't know what the shipping routes are and all that stuff. But is it possible somebody came in illegally to that location? And that's why they're also not in the database um, because they're not legal. So it's not a huge as big a problem there in Japan as in the United States, but it, it does exist. So we have a case where we have a completely unknown person who appears to me to be in, in his teens to early twenties. I think it's a thrill kill. I think he targeted the family because he wanted to see what it was like to kill. And he was, I think, bitter and maybe jealous of what they had. And he didn't. Uh, I think I say I think his family or at least one parent worked in fishing restaurant industry of some sort using those kind of knives. Uh, and I do believe he lives at home with his parent, a mom, at least because she's cooking for him. Uh, he could have eaten from the restaurant, too, however. Uh, so he could be living with an uncle, for example, and work for a restaurant cleaning it for the restaurant. He eats the restaurant food and it might be a Korean restaurant, you know, something like that. But he, and does he skateboard? Maybe. Is he in with these kids? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe he's, is foreign enough that they don't, they looks enough like them, but you know, maybe they're just not into him. You know what I mean? Or he could just be born in Japan and his fingerprints weren't on record, but his family just works in poorer industries than this family and lives in maybe a, a you know, a small place. And maybe he just feels like 
he never got his due in the world. And then he got this fascination for this kind of uh, murder. And there was another family that was murdered just prior to that uh, in, in a horrific murder. And, you know, was he, was he inspired by that? Um, don't know. Um, there was a, the, the podcast does mention some two Chan stuff, which is um, uh, it's this two Chan is a, uh, it's a Japanese board. And some guy went on there saying how when, is 13 years old he was 13 years old and he wanted to kill somebody at the end of that year and then these people get killed and he said he killed animals and he this was his fantasy and uh was that the guy could be you know um 13 seems a little young to me i mean 13 year olds do some damage <laughs> but i'm not sure i think 13 would have been enough i think closer to the little higher teens or 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 in the early 20s but who knows? Um, uh, but they, they, they obviously weren't able to prove it was that guy either. Um, so he could be, he could be born Japanese um, and just, and just be, there's, you know, lots of people living there. And if you're just a small little guy living there, nobody pays attention to you. And also, you know, if you work at restaurants or in the fishing industry and you have a cut on your hand, oh my gosh, we're shocked. We, how did you get a cut on your hand? You work with the fishing industry or a restaurant. You cut just people cut themselves all the time. So this is also a good place you can go back into and nobody questions your, the cut on your hand. So um, that's why I think he's one his family or himself or all of them are in those industries in a poor situation. He became fa fascinated with this. Who knows how he got near them, how he found out about them, whether his when, whether his family wasn't paying much attention to him. So when he finished whatever he was doing, he just took off on his own go whatever you want to go. And I, I don't know the train system in that area, but you know, there's some trains where um, they're really, I don't know, uh, you can jump on and off trains. And so maybe his thing was just to go to the train track and jump off. And this was supposedly the, like the skateboard park. There wasn't any other skateboard parks in towns, you know, other towns nearby. So maybe this was a known place and, you know, he would zoom up there once in a while and who knows, maybe he skated by himself and been, didn't have friends up there. So he just did his own thing. You know, and maybe kept away from the people and they never really knew who he was. And um, and they just jumped back on the train and went back home. Maybe he was gone half the freaking night and his parents never paid attention. You know, um, maybe he didn't have a dad in his life. His mom was just happy if her son came home at all. So I, I don't know the whole situation, you know, the whole situation, what it would be. But this crime to me is a young person crime. It's a thrill crime. It's careless. And the only reason they haven't found him is because his fingerprints out in a database, his DNA is in a database that just never found the exact right guy. And also, there's another possibility, I'll, I'll mention this and then we'll go to your comments. Possibility. If he's a migrant, his family's a migrant, and they have people in other countries like Korea or China, and he comes home and his mommy or daddy, if he's got one, says, oh my God, what, if, what have you done? And he's done that. They don't want their family name ruined by this, this lunatic kid of theirs. They may spirit him out of the country. So you got, you got to, you got to leave. They may have a way to send him out of the country. And then he's just not in the country anymore. And they're looking all over for the guy and he's already gone. So I think that's possible. Uh, again, I don't know what the machinations would be to have some, get somebody to be able to leave the country, but they may have just gotten him out of there. Uh, so that's my theory on it. So I don't think all these other fanciful theories make any sense. And I, I question that he's one of the regular skateboarders. I just, but I do think he's in that age group. And I do think uh, he probably does have a skateboard at some point or wishes he did. Maybe a bicycle's over there and looks at him and wishes he were there. Um, but, or he was one of the skateboarders and people just didn't identify him, you know, because they don't like to talk to the police. Hard to say, but I think that's the, that, that's my profile of the guy. Um, who I think he's the guy would most likely be uh, based on the evidence. Um, and uh, so I'll get to your thoughts on that. All right. 69 comments here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so let's see what you have to say. Oh my goodness. Um, let's see. Uh, yes, he did have the, he did tell them to sh quiet down. So that's why they looked at them so hard. Um, uh, apparently now they, they, they used to have a statute and I think they've removed it so they can now, um, I think they could now uh, still arrest somebody. I think that's changed. Um, um, Don Hunter says, it seems to me he was just pissed off 
and had zero respect for anything related to the home. That's a very good point. Um, yeah, you know this, especially when you're when you're a psychopathic teenager, you do have disrespect for pretty much everybody and everything. So just trashing the place and looking all through this stuff, mocking them, whatever is in your little brainy, you know, going on. I'll eat your food. I'll shit in your toilet. You know, um, I'm going to play on your computer. Hey, you know, and do just do stuff. Even the theater tickets, which I I didn't. I think that's kind of weird. Um, was it just, was it, there was already something lined up for that thing. Was he just playing around with it? I, I don't know, because obviously, you know, he's probably not going to show up at the date. The, you know, if he got the tickets, would he show up there with his girlfriend? <laughs> I mean, the police are standing there going, so I don't know. I think he's just doing stuff because it's something to do. Um, yes. It, uh, yes. I read about this. Privacy laws are much more restrictive in Japan than they are in the U.S. It would be Difficult to ascertain the or, or, origin of evidence in Japan, even for law enforcement. Yeah, they're very cautious about that. Um, the train theory really makes sense. The trains wouldn't start running until five to five thirty a.m. Yeah, and if you're gonna, if you're tired, you could, you know, do you really want to go have to lay in the woods, or does the couch seem to be pleasant? <laughs> you just lay down and take a little nap, because you, you know, you have, if you're thinking about a teenage psychopath, they don't think the way an experienced person might think who's committing certain crimes. Um, and, and the way, look at the way some teenagers think anyway, some of you guys out there, some of you teenagers are just so smart, but some of you not so bright <laughs> and you just do silly things. Um, uh, could he have also stayed inside the house because there were people outside? Well, it's the middle of the night. I don't know that there are people outside. I mean, by the time he committed the finish the crime, Hmm. Well, the skateboarders could have been out there. And maybe he didn't want to be seen coming out of the house. Maybe there was still too much traffic on the street. And maybe he waited. He just thought, I'll wait till I don't, we don't know when he left. There's that issue of the computer in the morning that flipped back on. And that's, oh, I can't find the, what makes sense there. Uh, so originally they thought he stayed till like 10 in the morning, which, which makes zero sense to me. So I don't believe he was there in the morning. I believe he left before dawn. Uh, maybe he just, and I knew, I don't know how well he knew the area. Like, when do people start going to work there? You know, is it is still, is it quiet till 5.30 and then by six o'clock it's crazy? I don't know. And so how well does he know there would, would be the issue on that. Um, uh, there's two issues here. Um, the flushing toilet thing. There's a number of serial killers. Um, I think some burglars too, who like to not flush the toilet after they use it. They think it's funny to leave a little bit of themselves to discuss people when they come in the next day. And that's kind of a ha-ha gotcha thing. Um, uh, you're still, in, so still connected to the skaters. Well, it's certainly, at least the the general community, it's more, it, it makes more sense than any Korean hitman. <laughs> um, yes, the, this is true. The skater scenario could work with the skaters because it does, you know, just because it's, it's there doesn't mean that, you, know, you have to get there. And unless you live next to the skate park, which by the way, there are only six houses there. So unless you're in one of those six houses, you had still had to get there. So you had probably, you either had to ride your skateboard all the way there, ride a bicycle there, ride a car there, or ride a train to the area. So it's a good question. Um, oh, the skate, 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 skaters are right behind the house. He like literally probably could look out and see them. It's, it's pretty close to the house. Um, uh, yes, if he took the train, it would imply he couldn't walk back home. This is true. And that's why it's interesting that he did stay that long. Because, yeah, um, why didn't he just walk home? Uh, obviously, he, you know, he might be seen walking home, but he's wearing somebody else's clothes, so maybe they wouldn't know it was him anyway. <laughs> um, when he gets home, he walks in the door. Hi, Ma. She's like, what the hell are you wearing? You didn't. That wasn't what you were wearing when you left. What is this? You know, where's your, where's your, where's your, where's your, where's your fanny pack? Where's this? Where's that? Um, I'm going to say he would be questioned unless his home is not so homey, which is why I think something is not quite right. He could, I say he could he could easily live with an uncle someplace or or just live with a mother who's working you know 15 hours a day and is long, you know she doesn't pay any attention. Um, the clothing could have been his brother's clothing for all we know could, could not even have been his. Uh, oh, another possibility is that some of the question about the clothing. Is, is it also possible that uh, clothing was some people, I think the podcaster said, well, maybe went to a thrift store and I don't know about thrift stores in Japan in that area, but 
Maybe also this, uh, these were given to him at different points in time. Maybe they were given to some other relative and the relative then turned them over to him. So they're kind of a, mish, a little bit mishmash of whatever he's got. Um, maybe he stole the stole some clothes off of the people who worked in the restaurant. You know, it's hard to know. It's really hard to know. Um, uh, he could have been someone at the skate park uh, who observed the father complaining to someone. He doesn't necessarily have to be the one the father was confronting. That's correct. He could just, he could be lurking in the trees. You know, he could just be an out. He could be that guy just on the fringe, which nobody's paying attention to. They've seen that kid a couple times at the park, and you know, and they you know, and he just looks over and sees his father whining. A father maybe he doesn't have, or the father doesn't pay attention to him. And here's this guy out there. Maybe he sees the girls out there and the mom out there, and he's like, oh, it's next week. Such a nice little family. Could be. Uh, thrill seeking, pissed off of the world, just disrespectful. Yeah, and and, a psych and definitely psychopathic because you can't kill four people and have ice cream afterwards unless you are. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that's very true too. Um, it's a place where they could anybody in that park, skate park, could quietly observe the house and kind of plan how to gain entry. Right. So I don't necessarily think he had to be somebody who had been in the house. Um, now, the question about the window, I don't know. The, the screen was pulled out. I don't know how hard it was to get in that window. So um, I'm not sure of that. It's it's winter, mind you. So we're not talking about summer when somebody opened up the windows. Um, I, I haven't been able to get information on whether normally. Now, somebody said um, that was an area where people were careful that when night came, they locked their doors, and checked, locked their windows and checked everything. But I'm, I'm going to say it's probably an over-exaggeration because even if people say I locked my, I made sure my house was locked. My, my door was locked. My front door was locked. My back door was locked. And they might even check the window of their bedroom. But did they check the bathroom window every single night? You know, and and so it's really hard to say. I mean, was he ever in the house, in, you know, for any reason where he could open up that window? Um, but again, I haven't heard from a police report that there were workers in the house or, or he was one of the students that came over there to get help. Or anything or anybody who asked to use the bathroom you know and could have opened up the window um i don't know if there's more than one bathroom in the house there's, that was just supposed to second floor um or whether he just took his chances and he got up there and he's able to open the window and sometimes it's just luck um meth meth not that i know of i mean they well oh no no they did check i'm sorry they checked the feces no no alcohol i guess whether they checked there's nothing in a system yeah that's interesting um and yeah, want to know how it feels to kill someone. That's a very teenagery thing. We have that, that we've had quite a few of those cases where one teenager kills another teenager or they kill a kid or they kill a family just to see what it's like. I, I wanted to find out what it was like to kill somebody and watch them die. I wanted to feel my knife go in them. That's what you get. Um, so, uh, um, that's a good point. Uh, Leslie says, person wanted to snoop into their lives, dumping garbage, purse contents in the tub to sift through their life, where they would go, what they would buy, what interests them. Yeah, like checking web bookmarks. That's a good point. Maybe to see if he's like, I think, a poorer person who doesn't have such a great life. It may fascinate him because if everybody he knows is struggling as a, a fisher person's, you know, uh, by the you know, by the sea or the restaurant workers, some of them not so legal, uh, working in restaurants and, you know, working 12, 14 hour days, um, living in a room, maybe a room with three or four people, those kind of situations where, you know, life isn't so good. And then you go into this house and these people weren't rich, mind you. This wasn't a really super big house, but it was a nice house. And he goes in there and, he, you know, they've got nice things and they're not rich things, but they're nice things. And so, yeah, maybe he just wants to rumble through everything. After he's killed them all, he's like, and now not only gonna I'm gonna kill you, not only did I kill you, but I can mess with all your stuff too. I can see exactly who you were, check you all out. Ha ha ha. Look at this, look at that, look at this. And and more disrespect. Throwing taking the purse and throwing contents in the toilet. It's a lot of disrespect. And again, it doesn't look to me like somebody's just searching the place for a uh, let's say somebody came in, they're they're looking for uh Oh, I don't know, a contract that was signed that once they can get rid of it, they're going to be $100,000 richer. They are going to go, they, the bookshelves, for example, were untouched. So things weren't done logically. So it's not like they went through, opened up doors and went like this and then opened up the next door. There's no reason to throw things in the bathtub and in the toilet. So it, it, it's, that's, uh, that's crazy, crazy, crazy thinking. Um, so uh, I think he just borrowed that too. He might've been killing time because he had some time to kill because he was going to 
take the train, maybe, possibly. Um, uh, interesting, maybe being dressed in a way that didn't stand out. That's true. When we're talking, uh, that's true. When we're talking, you were, I was asked about the, um, was it, uh, was he, you know, trying to disguise himself? That is possibly true. Maybe he, the, the skaters say, that's not exactly skater stuff. So maybe he wanted to pretend to be like a skater so that, yeah, if he wandered around the park, no one would pay attention to him. That's true. The only thing that's curious about that is he wore the cologne <laughs> or the cologne was in whatever. So it's like, why would he have the cologne stuff? I mean, that wouldn't be necessary for a disguise. But the rest of it makes sense as a possibility. Um, let's see. Uh, um, I don't think the incel thing is here at all. I think this is this is a completely different time 20 years ago when the incel thing wasn't huge. And he wa wasn't like women weren't going for him, so he wanted to kill off women. Like some people we know in uh, Idaho, the U.S. Um, let's see. Um, oh, you're, li you're liking the quick train ride for a skater or skater fringe type? Not, not a bad thought there. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, no, no, the sand, they checked all kinds of sand. And the only places the sand was from was the Mojave Desert and the peninsula. Literally, just these two places. That's it. There's. It wasn't regular sand. It wasn't like the sand from a sandbox or sand from another beach, sand from any place else in the world. These two places, only place with that kind of sand. Very specific. So, And I just don't buy the Mojave Desert thing. I think that's just, that's just, that's just getting into uh, some very bizarre outrageous theory thing, which if you're writing a book and then funny, the podcaster says he, he's a crime writer, I'm a, a fiction writer, and he really kind of loves the Mojave Desert story. And he went all the way over there to California. He collected sand from this uh, town called California City, I think. And then he, he went to the base and he collected sand. I mean, he really got into it, you know, and then he had the sand tested. He loves that theory. But I, as a profiler, I don't think that holds up. The rest of it is just doesn't connect with this this stuff, I, I, I considered it, believe you me, I considered the possibility of a being an, a person, a military person from the United States coming to Japan, uh, traveling in and out, or a, a child of that person uh, who's stationed in Japan. I looked at that, but it just, it just didn't, it just doesn't work for me because of so many of the other issues. And again, remember the totality of the evidence, the totality of the evidence is the clothing, the sand, the food he eats, um, how he gets in the location, the knife issue, and how he wrapped the knife. These are all this piece of information, which lead me to believe we're not talking about stay somebody stationed in the military. That just doesn't work for me. Um, uh, as far as this is okay, this is a good good th theory here. Let's see. Studying in Tokyo and went back home to hometown in this location, Amura, I don't have to pronounce it again, uh, New York break. Hi, Rosanna. Rosanna, you wrote me and said you've lived in Japan. So, yes. Okay. I'm going to take you seriously. Um, yeah. Uh, possibly. That is possible, too, that he was had connections to both locations and could have been a student. And they thought that because of the because of the marker that was part of something. In his, but, you know, markers are not only things students use. They're around for a lot of people. You know, you might be uh, let's say you're writing uh, on a board for your, for the restaurant the food of the day. If you're not using chalk, you might use marker. Um, people might mark packages with things. If you're working in, uh, in a fishing industry, I don't know. You might take a marker out and, you know, write on the side of a pail, you know. So I'm not sure that means student to me, um, although it can. Um, would a student who's studying in Tokyo or in that area could be. I mean, I, I, I can't take away that one. I, I tend to think. He's not doing that well. <laughs> that's that's just my thought. I have trouble thinking he's actually a, a, a college student. Uh, not that a college student can't do this. Um, and he could have, you know, yeah, killed him and then just gone south back home um, and come back. Yeah, I, it's possible. So I wouldn't I wouldn't take that one away. So if I were looking at this case, Marzana, um, I'd keep that in the mix because it's that's that's possible. Yeah, I keep it because, you know, when you're doing profile, the last thing you want to do is say, you know, I, Pat Brown, will tell you that his family is either a restaurant worker or in the fishing industry. And we are going to ignore every other possibility. <laughs> or I think he's a he's probably 17 or 18 years old, probably doesn't have he's not in school or if he's in school, he's not going very much. He's not a college student. Um, he probably helps out 
with the fishing or the, in the restaurant, probably some crappy job or if any, um, I think that's where you need to look. And that's the only place you should ever look because Pat Brown, if I say that's who I think it might be, you never want to look anyplace else. <laughs> that's just stupid. You know, that's stupid. And it would be not doing due diligence. You can take, if I went to the police and gave them my profile right now, I would want them. And this is, this is why I tell people, this is why this crap about profilers is so overblown. Well, a profiler can put their hand on their head and say, uh, the person is 15 to 20 years old, lives with his mother, has a dog, works in the fishing industry, da 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 da, da. No, we cannot do that. That's nonsense. What we can do is look at the information and analyze it. And then I would say to the police, here is my profile of the crime. Here is where I'd look. Here are the places I would look. This will be my top place to look. But you can take, you can go look there, take that into consideration, but there may be some, some variation there, or it may be half of that was close, but there was that issue. They turned out to be a student. Um, and I personally, you know, that wasn't my number one choice, but maybe he's uh, somehow, uh, you know, his family's in the fishing industry, but he managed to get into college and he's going there. Maybe he's failing. Maybe he's doing poorly in college and, and he's, he's embarrassed and he's now he's hateful. He's going to, maybe he's going to fail out of college. And so he's going to end up back on the peninsula having to fish for God's sakes. And so he's on, he's on his way on vacation, coming back home or, you know, whatever to tell his family that he's failed out of college. He's decides I'm going to kill this family <laughs> and then I'm going to go on my way. Perfectly reasonable that that could be true. So yes, your theory is fine. And so the police should look at, at, a number of theories. Now, the hitman theory from Korea <laughs> is pretty out there. Should the police consider it for even a second? They can consider it. It's just it doesn't match the crime very well. So if you're going to have things lined up, you say, okay, this is more like we'd be, we'll look here first, then second, then third, then fourth, then fifth. And once in a while, you end up being surprised and you're like, hmm, damn, it turned out to be a Korean hitman. Who knew? No, profilers aren't re mind readers or magicians or you no, know, they don't have contact to the, 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 the killer world. And so we're a hundred percent right. This is nonsense. Um, so it can't be done. Um, but thank you for that. That was excellent. Um, Marzana says, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. That's true about the Koreans. They are called Zanichi Konkokujin. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my very bad, Whatever that, whatever that means. Though I think people would just come on tourist visa and overstay. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Um, yeah. It, you know, I don't say that there's a, every country has illegal immigrants, people who do come on tourist visas, overstay, people who sneak in off of whatever they sneak in off of, whether it's over a border or it's on, on by sea. Now there are certain countries that are much stricter and as far as, patrolling those areas to not allow this to happen. Um, and there are those who, that are stricter in, in catching people and ch checking them out. But there's always that gray line where not everybody, some people still get in the country and stay there illegally, no matter what country you're in, except maybe North Korea, because nobody wants to go there. But, you know, you know um, but that always happens. And so you can't count anything out. But um yeah, thank you for that. That's that's interesting. Okay, let me let me look at this. Thank you. Oh, you're so useful. Oh, check just check the fingerprints on Japanese website. They indeed take them only from 17 on, unless you have a life permit. And they started that in 2007. I think that's why I looked at one of those websites too, and that's what I came up with. But again, it's the internet. So if I were doing, I always point this out to me. If I were writing an entire book, when I when no my the series I'm doing now on Cleopatra, right? I mean. I point out, you know, when I wrote this book, I spent a tremendous amount of time. I've got 93 sources in here <laughs> and I went to, I went to Egypt twice. I worked extremely hard to make sure that I analyzed all the different details and then, then reanalyzed and made sure they were right and double checked and triple checked. I'm doing, you know, but here I'm doing a YouTube show. You know, it's like I got limits to how much time and energy I can do to do 50 hours worth of checking on uh, fingerprint issues because <laughs> I'm not working on the case. This is just educational. So yeah, that's what I found too. Um, this is a good question, Elisa. Um, do I think it's a killer's first crime or even the bigger concern? Would you be committing another crime like this? Meanwhile? Well, you know, 
I think which is David Cantor, he, I think he thought it was awful bold that he went and killed four people like that on a first time around. However, however, if we take a look at the Idaho murders, uh, and we had the four the four students that were killed. Um, I'm not sure Koberger has ever killed anybody before. Now, the first thing happened with that crime. I thought it was, I said, there's only two possibilities for me. The one girl who broke up with a boyfriend and was kind of ghosting him and they had his issues with the dog. And I didn't know, was he a nice guy or was he kind of, mm, you know, because uh, a lot of times that would be the thing. The boyfriend comes in to kill the girl and ends up killing some other people. That was a possibility. The other possibility I said was an incel, some incel who had this growing anger against women. So, he was kind of a, not a stalking one woman in particular. It's not like a regular stalker, but someone who gets to the point where he wants to do this one thing. And so Koberger, who I believe is guilty as heck, because the evidence certainly points that way, but it's not proven yet. Um, uh, I think he went in there to have his heyday. Uh, and then the question was, why did ever, after it happened, people started trying to link him to every other crime in the U.S. that had anything to do with somebody breaking into a house and killing somebody, even if it was 2,000 miles away and he would have been 20, 10 at the time. You know, they were looking everywhere. So far, they have not come up with him matching any other crime. And he's he was near 30, not one other crime. Um, so can a person go from zero to killing four people? I think the answer is yes. Um, you don't necessarily have to start with killing one person. You can have this that desire to do this big thing, um, especially in mass murders. Mass murders is much more common in a mass murder than a serial killer. He didn't rape anybody. It wasn't a serial crime. It wasn't the kind of, even if you're not raping somebody, there are serial types of crimes um, uh, where like David Berkowitz shot one after the other after the other. There's a guy in California who's been stabbing people. He stabbed three people and they weren't all on the same night. He just, he stabbed one person, then another night he stabbed another person, and the third night he stabbed another person. Two of them died. Um, he's a serial, he's a serial killer, but he doesn't rape anybody and uh, he just liked to stab them. But mass murderers, often they will do things in one fell swoop. They will kill off their entire family. Uh, then, you know, the, it's a, if it's a family mass murder, they'll kill the whole entire family. Or they'll kill the neighbors. Or they'll kill a bunch of whatever. There are people come in and do one, one thing like this. So do I think he had to have done this before? No. Um, the concept that he was so calm at the scene. Uh, and I think David Cantor it was a little bit like, it's kind of hard to believe he never did anything before, yet he goes in here and he so calmly kills four people and then eats food and takes a nap and plays around. It doesn't seem to be bothered by those four dead people in the house. Uh, well, I, I see his point. Uh, I mean, you tend to think he would build up a little more to that level of calmness because a lot of times first crimes are a mess, but this was a mess. He cut himself, <laughs> you know, he cut himself, he left all his evidence there. So it wasn't brilliant. Maybe he's just so psychopathic. He just, after he killed them and he looked at them and thought, that's cool. Chuck a blanket over their head and then he just enjoyed their house. Yeah, so, but it's hard to say, it really is. And, and, and one has to be careful again of overstating that so that you don't look for some, you only look in the, uh, uh, look for somebody who's already committed a crime and you ignore the person who hasn't. Koberger, you know, he didn't have a criminal record and he was a criminal justice. He was getting his what? master's PhD, whatever, in criminal justice, <laughs> you know, go figure. But he was that. So um, let's see. Uh, would I think he'd do it again is your other question. Well, I certainly wouldn't want him around. Um, some people just have their one moment in the sun um, and don't return to killing because they kind of satisfy that desire to see what it's like. Um, but it's still psychopathic and he has no problem with violence. I wouldn't want him around. Um, and that's why the concern could be if he left the country and went to move someplace else, he could kill other people. And maybe they just haven't figured, they never figured out, you know. Um, let's see. Um, Joe says, uh, yeah, I read this on Wiki. The investigation of the murders is among the largest in Japanese history involving over 246,744 investigators who collected over 12,545 pieces of evidence. Um, I can't, the, the amount of investigators that blows me away. I didn't know we had that many investigators in, 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 in Japan to begin with, you know, um, crazy. I mean, they worked so hard on this case that they just never could come up with the guy. And sometimes the problem is, is that the guy is just not noticeable. And if he's not in the databank, he's not noticeable and his family's covering for him. 
just they never know who it is. I mean, he just may not be around. He may have say may have been shipped out of the country and they're looking and looking and looking where he isn't, you know. Um, that, uh, well, that's true, too. Huh. Sometimes burglars like, no, that's a, that's also a burglar serial killer thing. Like they like like poop on somebody's bed or poop in the corner. It's, just, it's, it's, it's to make you realize I was there. I broke into your place and I did this to you. It's crossing those boundaries. It's like a, a version of rape, essentially, because people feel very violated when their homes are invaded, when their cars are invaded. They feel violated and, and for good reason. Um, let's see. Um, oh, this too. Yeah. Lila says a lot of burglars eat food from the fridge and you'd be surprised how many also take a nap. <laughs> it's not that unusual, except when you murder, you'd think you want to get the hell out of Dodge. Um, yeah. And you know, the other thing possible is that a lot of times mass murderers don't care that much if they're caught. That's why so many of them get shot. Like let's say they go shoot up a place. They get killed at the end of the day. They wanted the moment. They're not concerned about what happens after the moment. So who knows? This guy may just come in here, did his thing, enjoyed ransacking the house and disrespecting them, got tired, took a nap, waited, maybe, you know, just wanted to rest for a while. Was, oh, we're going to take the train in the morning. If he got caught, he got caught. If he didn't, he did. So it's hard, it's hard to know. Um, oh, disrupt their orderly life. That's another good point. Hmm. Because dad was a, a freak for exactness and I, he, everything had to be in order for him. I don't know how orderly the house was among I guess it was very orderly. And since he wrote every single thing down, he'd ever, supposedly he wrote down everything he'd ever purchased or did a financial transaction. Like since, like since he was three years old or something, it was crazy. And um, maybe, yeah, maybe the, one, the guy liked to destroy the order in their house. So yeah, maybe it's very possible. Um, let's see what else you have to say here. Um, uh, that could be too. Uh, it wasn't necessarily trying to disguise, but just wanted to look average. Yeah, fitting in, just sort of fitting in. It wouldn't be, no, would not be noticeable. Oh, that's a good point, Lisa. Lila, wait a minute. I hope you're saying Lila. Comment. Lila, <laughs> Lila also needs to poop. Oh, Lila, no. After the adrenaline rush, that is why a lot of criminals need to crap after the crime. Oh, Lila, are you committing crimes and pooping? No, I think there's a comma after the Lila. <laughs> but yes, that's true too. Um, good point. Very good point. Um, and you know, he's also the reason why he's probably thirsty as hell and maybe his, his blood sugar is dropping. So he's eating all the ice cream. He's a teenager too. That needs, you know, if he's, if he's a teenager, let me say if, um, he, he has to replenish the calories burned. Um, so yeah, I think all those things are not unreasonable for, to do under those circumstances. So yeah, absolutely. Very good. <laughs> yeah, I like the way that was worded too. <laughs> ah, gosh. Um, right on a paper, the fish has wrapped it. There you go. You, you know, if you're selling fish, yeah, you wrap it up and you just, that could be, say, this is why you can't get, you got to look for all the other possibilities because you never know when somebody, um, for example, here, here's, a, here's a simple example. Um, uh, a, a person is stabbed and someone sees a woman ru running from the scene. She jumps into a vehicle and she drives away and then the, she crashes the car somewhere and then disappears. From the scene, they say, we saw a woman dressed in an Indian sari. And they go to the car and in the car is Indian food, but not the kind of Indian food Americans eat, but the type of Indian foods, Indians eat, <laughs> you know, totally Indian stuff. They also find 22 karat gold bangle in the car, something that's very Indian and Americans never don't own because that's an Indian thing. And so they say, well, clearly now they're looking all over for that Indian woman. Then it's me because <laughs> I wear Indian clothes. I have, I have, Gold bangles. I eat Indian food. I like traditional Indian food. I can cook it on my own stove. I can buy it. And the, some of it I get from, you know, certain places, my friends or, you know, snacks that, you know, if I go into a store and I, I brought home snack, Indian snacks and no, none of my American friends know what it is. So now they've, they've concluded absolutely between the clothing, the woman was wearing Indian clothing, a sari and wearing Indian jewelry and eating absolute Indian food that Americans don't eat must be an Indian. So the old saying, you know, if, if you hear hoofbeats, it's, it's a horse, not a zebra. 
sometimes it's a zebra, <laughs> even if they're not in Africa. <laughs> because I joke about that because we had zebras down right, right 10 minutes down the street. There was a story suddenly there were people seeing zebras and they were because this guy had zebras on his farm out here and nobody, you know, I never even knew it. I've lived here 10 years and my, my daughter was with the police. They had to go out there and help round up zebras, you know. I wondered one of those. <laughs> I, I think it was a kind of highlighting market type marker thing. <clears throat> yes. Yep. Um, um, Lelia says, I think he feels left out and covets the family life and prosperities people have. Staying in their home, let him have a taste of this life he'll never get. That's another good point. This is why I tend to lean toward him having a life that's not quite as well off. Because I think when you, yeah, if you go, let's let's say you live in a, a one a one room apartment and you got three, four people living there and it's kind of messy and you know it's nothing's fancy in there and you go break into another person's apartment that's a one bedroom apartment i mean a one room apartment it's not big thrill to you know <laughs> looks just like your own you don't go sneaking around in there but you break into somebody's you know, million dollar mansion holy crap you know you want to see every room in the place you know and touch all their stuff yeah i think it's very reasonable um let's see uh <laughs> Your English is fine. Mine not, mine's not so good either sometimes. <laughs> so, yes, I'm glad you're not shy. That's that. That's good. Don't be shy. Um, <laughs> how many times? I can't even say my name right sometimes on here. Oh, my goodness. Uh, let's see. Um, well, there's an interesting thought. Okay, I'm going to put this up. See, I like I like this group. This is why I like my group here because I like when I, I see thinking going on. I don't think he was planning on killing all of them, but the boy woke up the house. Well, I don't know would he be there but to kill because that would be a terrible time to come in and steal because there's four people in the house. And it is too small a house in a way to be able to like be on one end and not the other. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible? It's possible, but I will say this, Andini, I think if it wasn't something in his head to kill everyone, he wouldn't have been so calm afterwards. I think he'd be flipping freaking out. I only came in there to steal stuff and end up killing everybody. I think he loses mind. So I think his desire to kill had to be there before he entered the house. Um, we oh, never say this. We don't know that he's never, he's never killed again. How do we know? How do we know he's never killed again? How, how is it that a serial killer can, uh, you know, takes like 20 victims before they catch the guy. And then they didn't realize he killed the other 19. So, they don't know the same guy is doing the killing that did one killing is doing the next killing. Unless you have DNA connecting everything. A lot of times people think it's different people. Um, then there are situations where um, I just read this at the uh, hangout uh, this week um, that this was one guy and he, he shot his parents, buried them in the backyard, took the car and went to a, went to a drive-in movie. <laughs> and then he ended up being on the run for 40 years, remarried, remar had kids, remarried. Um, and as far as I know, he didn't commit another crime, but clearly he's a psychopath, but maybe that was his one moment in the sun. He, in other words, mass murderers often a family mass murders don't necessarily kill again. It's a situational murder. They wanted that one time to, well, this kid wanted the he, parents were getting in his way and he wanted the dang car. Maybe once he got that, he didn't feel a need to kill again. So, um, just because somebody's, but again, we don't even know who the guy is. He could, he could have I say he could be in another country killing lots of people or he could still be in Japan killing people, but they just never, they didn't, he didn't leave DNA at that scene or, or fingerprints and they don't know it's him. You see this, we don't know. We have no idea. Or maybe he got killed in a car rush, crash, you know. So before he got to kill again, he got killed. Maybe he committed suicide and it wasn't ever connected to this. Just don't know. We don't, we have no idea um, at all. Um, Well, yeah, this is a, yeah, uh, when, when, when you don't see, succeed, try, try again. So, yeah, he's already tried to stab them. Uh, it's a child he's stabbed. Uh, when he already killed a little boy, he doesn't have a problem with killing. That's for darn sure. Um, and so there's also the possibility that he, again, you know, has been in an industry which does, has a relative amount of killing. That doesn't make, let's say, tunas are 
big big beasts you know what i mean if you're tuna fishermen for example i mean you bring them in you have to i, I don't know the exact method to killing them but i mean they're a large fish and they're like almost mammal size you know um and you're killing fish after fish after fish it does it does sort of make you not have an easier time killing shall we say and we've had some cases in history where people who are butchers um they butchered animals and then they just find it's not that hard to move from an animal to a person. Um, again, I'll say this for all these industries, just because you work in the fishing or, or butchering industry, just because you're a hunter doesn't make you a killer of people, you know, but sometimes the repeated uh, sight of, of death, the repeated, the repeated action of killing can, that's one reason that it's so bad for children to watch one movie after the other, where people die, die, die. And why certain Games are not healthy where you shoot, shoot, shoot. Yes, the majority of people will not go on to committing violent crimes. But the fact that you keep putting that into your head lessens your sensitivity to it. So it's 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 worthwhile. Um, uh, 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 can I repeat the question? Well, I never saw it. Um, <laughs> how can we be sure that the blood, palm print, footprint, f fingerprints belong to one person only? I guess because I saw... They, the finger, all the fingerprints they got were one person. All the blood was from one person. So could there be a second person in the house who didn't leave those or left a smudged version of something they couldn't tell was a second person? The answer to that is yes. But according to the police and all of the evidence, they came up with one person. And I do agree with them. I think it is 99% likely it was only one person in that house having his little, doing his little thing. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, Lauren said, I think he was poor and he ate the food at the house and stayed there because he didn't have the options to provide food and a space to go for himself that easily. Well, he did have a nice, he did have food before he came. Um, they, and they said they thought it was like a, a mother, a meal a mother would make, in my opinion, or a restaurant. It's not that special. You know, it wasn't a hamburger. It wasn't chips. Um, so he did have access to food. Um, he didn't eat, you know, he, he didn't eat healthy stuff. Well, he did eat a melon. He ate melon. He scooped it out of his hand. And he, ate, he ate melon. So he ate melon and he ate the, the ice cream and had the drink. Um, but he was there for a while. So he just, I could just be making use of it. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, not saying they didn't have a place to live, but he didn't have a ton of options. Being able to get a cab, book a hotel. Yeah, I don't think he had money. And, and of course, on the other hand, you know, it's not a great idea to leave a crime scene in a cab. Uh, it's usually not smart. Um, but I have heard of it being done. And of course, staying in a hotel, that again is not wise because you have to go through reception unless you've already gotten your hotel and you can just slip by. But he didn't do any, there was so much crap in the house that, um, not that crap, but you know, so much stuff that he left, so much evidence he left, he wasn't careful. I think he could accept that he might be caught and he didn't care. I think he just didn't get caught. That's all. I just don't think he cared. Oh, I have to go, oh, that's nice. I have to go, but happy Mother's Day to all the beautiful mamas out there. Bless you all. Thank you, Pat. Such a great lesson as usual. I'm glad you liked it. And happy Mother's Day. That is tomorrow, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I for, almost forgot. And we have more ha ha happy Mother's Day wishes. And um, oh, Lauren says maybe it's just broke at the time. And that's why he took the cash. Yes, he did take cash because it was there. Um, he didn't take everything. He didn't take all the stuff he should have been able to take. But maybe he did grab cash because it was useful. And he wasn't a wealthy person himself. And yeah, I think that's true. I think the cash was going to be nice for him. Yeah. Um, oh, that's possible. He got care more careful with crimes later. Also possible. After that, he goes, man, did I leave that much evidence there? I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm not going to do that again. No. That's possible. Um, oh, that's that desensitized to killing. I was looking for that word desensitized. Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> There's a book in that. <laughs> um, what about Jacob Levy? <laughs> my 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 Jack the Ripper suspect. I'm not sure what Jack. You think it's Jack? You think it's Jacob Levy? I don't think he's around anymore. But I do think he is most likely the Jack the Ripper suspect. Um, the best Jack the Ripper suspect. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This would not happening. Hitmen do. Hitmen go in. They get out with as little evidence left as possible. They take care of business. And not that kind of business. No. Um, motive, thrill, thrill kill. I absolutely think it's a thrill kill. Not thrill kill, maybe um, jealousy. 
I think mostly those would be the two. That's why I think, again, we're talking about a young person. I don't think we're talking about a 40-year-old. So um, so that's it. Uh, that's what I've gone on. That's a fascinating case because you know, it's just so rare in that there's so much evidence. And he was there so long. And they have no idea who it is. I mean, I, that's just unique. Um, so I'm glad I got the request over and over to do the case because it really is very interesting. <laughs> so, um, so thank you for being here. And uh, yeah, it would be nice if they ever figure it out. But like many cases that go unsolved for so long, unless they get some really freaky luck all of a sudden, it's been 20 years and his fingerprints and his DNA haven't popped up any place. So I say he could easily be dead for all we know. Dead and buried a long time ago. And then the sad thing is once you look in the wrong way, or the person's no longer around you to even do anything with, you can spend 20 years more wasting huge amount of manpower and money on a case you cannot forward. And, but you won't, but you don't even know it. So it's just, you're just spinning your wheels for no reason, but that's the way it goes. And that's why it's so important to solve cases early on, because first of all, it protects the community. It gets justice, but also you don't spend 20, 30, 40 years going down empty avenues. So yeah. Uh, thank uh, Lauren says, thank you very much for teaching about this case today and sharing your take on it. You're most welcome. I uh, say I'm glad to have done it. So uh, anyway, all righty. <sighs> oh, happy. A more happy Mother's Day to all the moms. Yes. <laughs> all right, guys, I'm going to I'm going to head out myself. And uh, so thank you for being here. And um, I'll, I'll be back with the next um, chapter of uh, Cleopatra. And I've got to I've got to get another one out for Ask. Profiler Pat, that's my new little advice playlist. Remember playlist, Cleopatra playlist, Ask Profiler Pat playlist, uh, crime playlist, case list, hangout list, playlist. Check the playlist out uh, if that's you know you have an interest in that particular you know some particular thing um, and you know because otherwise you have to go through the entire channel and then you just get bored and, and give up. So just go to the playlist you're most interested in if you want to go back in time and see stuff. So anyway, thank you for being here and I will see you soon. Bye.